So I was asked to talk about what do libraries bring to the table to enable researchers' success in this changing environment. First, I'll talk about what inherent and professional skills and knowledge do we have to support the transition and enable researcher success. Second, I'll talk about what systems and services are already in place that can help institutions and researchers respond to the requirements. And third, I'll talk about what can and will libraries do next to help ensure researcher awareness and support changes necessary in researcher workflow to ensure compliance. So, what do we as librarians bring to the table by virtue of our skills and knowledge? First, librarians are skilled at bringing order and making very complex amounts of information accessible. And the funder mandates are, as a whole, very complex. Next, through our subject liaison, and by subject liaisons, I mean librarians who have library and subject expertise and are assigned to work with specific departments and colleges and do instruction work, these subject liaisons are strong supporters already of the research process for students and faculty. This means we create guides for finding very specific types of information, and we train scholars to navigate complex information systems. At research institutions, we're often fully embedded in departments and colleges. Finally, we are collaborators and generalists by nature, meaning that we are already connecting parts of our institutions together by virtue of our central place in the structure of the university. If we take a few steps back and think about this event, it was a library that brought us all here today to talk about the issues facing us. This is no surprise to me. Academic libraries are often considered to be the heart of the institution. Because of our support of nature, our wide reach, our responsibility to all facets of the university, to students, faculty, researchers, and staff, we are well poised to provide support throughout the scholarly communication process, including helping researchers with tools and information they need to comply with funder mandates. Libraries have the relationships, the outreach and presentation skills, the collaborative mandate to bring researchers and various parts of the institution together to discuss and plan to solve the complex issues we face. So moving on, secondly, I'll talk about what ways have librarians already created support systems that can translate directly into this changed environment. In recent years, librarians have laid the groundwork for a lot of the support mechanisms that we already have in place to enable researcher success. Librarians were early and outspoken advocates for open and public access to academic and scholarly communication. Because of what librarians call the serials crisis, we were by necessity early advocates. For those who are wondering what the serials crisis was and is, let me digress for a few moments. Since the early 1990s, a number of things converged to create what academic and research libraries call the serials crisis. These things include the proliferation of new academic journal titles, a push from major academic publishers to buy journals from learned societies, significantly increased subscription costs for libraries, and over time, the transfer of academic journals from print to electronic versions, which gave the publishers the opportunity to license access and not sell content, which in turn put the sharing of academic information under contract law instead of copyright law. Briefly, I'll describe the consequences of these events in concrete terms. First, more journals meant libraries needed to subscribe to more titles. Second, for-profit ownership of journals meant costs could and did increase to astronomical heights, an increase of, especially in some fields, more than 400% over a 20-year period. Third, under contract law, where libraries pay for access to digital information, versus owning the print, libraries are constrained in how they can share academic information. Interlibrary loan can be affected, 
Permission is now needed for some classroom use of academic materials, and faculty have had to ask publishers for permission to use their own work in teaching and research, or even to share it with other scholars on their websites. Publishers have recently begun sending scholars takedown notices to remove their own articles from their online scholarly profiles and web pages. Fourth, for-profit publishers created new ways of selling academic information to libraries. One of the most used is called bundling, which allows them to write contracts that A, span a period of time, often three to five years, and B, include predetermined annual percentage increases, C, do not allow for changes or title cancellations, which takes away the flexibility in often unstable library budgets. This in turn often leads libraries to commit to spending the majority of their budgets on academic journals, mostly in STEM fields, which leaves book purchasing, mainly in the humanities and some social sciences, to fall by the wayside because of the contracts with large journal publishers. publishers. And finally, in the US, this serials crisis affected public universities more deeply and earlier than private ones. However, private institutions are now responding to the serials crisis and having their own budgetary issues. Globally, particularly in developing nations, the effect is drastic. For example, at the University of Mexico, one of Mexico's top schools, the situation is so dire that the university can only subscribe to one print, not electronic copy, of the journal Nature for the entire university. They can't afford the electronic subscription service. Thus, the serials crisis is a global problem for the advancement of knowledge. So to get back to what libraries have already done, in the mid to late 1990s, libraries brought the conversation about open access to their individual campuses through forums and events for faculty and researchers to discuss the issues. Libraries pulled together all the players to analyze the challenges we were facing and supported a wide variety of collaborations to propose and test possible solutions. On a national level, libraries supported the creation of groups like SPARC. SPARC, which is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, was founded in 1998. And it is now an international alliance of nearly 800 academic and research libraries working to create a more open system of scholarly communication. More recently, as Anne referred to, librarians formed COPI, or the Coalition of Open Access Policy Institutions. Its members are librarians and library administrators who work at institutions that have an open access policy or that are actively working on one. Activism and federal lobbying by these groups and others in large part led to the passing of FERPA, the introduction of FASTER in the House and the Senate, and in the same month that FASTER was introduced, February 2013, the White House issued the directive that we are responding to today. That directive required federal agencies with over 100 million in annual conduct of research and development expenditures to develop a plan, as we already heard, to make peer-reviewed publications publicly accessible to search, retrieve, and analyze. So our support for researchers is a natural and desired outcome of our support for the directive in the first place. It's just the sort of action with teeth we've been pushing for from the federal government and which we are poised to support. Librarians have also created some specific tools and support that are already in place. First, through the creation of research data management programs and tools, librarians have done a lot to support researchers in making their data open access, specifically in the area of creating data management plans. For example, in January 2011, eight institutions, five of them academic libraries, contributed personnel and development to create what's called the DMP tool or data management plan tool. This tool can be customized for individual institutions and is a free service that helps researchers and institutions create high quality data management plans that meet funder requirements. Next, many institutions have passed open access policies and have built or are in the process of building open access repositories for a variety of types of scholarly output. 
most often articles and conference papers, but in some cases, data. These institutions have been exploring workflow management tools that can include funding information and can be used by researchers to track their articles and data and help ensure they are compliant. Through groups like COPY and Spark, best practices for processes, repository design, and outreach can be easily shared and built on at a wide variety of institutions. And while Spark requires a paid membership, much of its output is freely available. And membership in COPY is free, as long as institutions meet the requirement of having or working on an open access policy. As a member of the steering committee of COPY and as past chair, I can tell you that as soon as that AAU memo came out that prompted the flurry of concern on many of our campuses, COPY members were sharing emails with each other on how different campuses were talking about supporting compliance. So now we turn to the future and the third piece of what I wanted to talk about. What specifically can libraries do next, knowing that we have a lot we can use already and build on to get us there? First, librarians can help decipher the individual funder mandates and create guides for individual disciplines and funding requirements for how to comply for both articles and data. My hunch is that many librarians are working on these guides already, and through some excellent early work from Spark, we have a clear, though complex, amount of information to pull from. And a lot of this is available on the Spark website. Second, as we've already been doing for open access in general, we can use our librarians who are subject liaisons and who are doing outreach and training to raise awareness of and teach researchers how to comply with the requirements. We can hold workshops and training sessions for faculty, researchers, grad students, and postdocs, and everyone involved in the process on how to manage their own data and their published works so that version control is possible. Third, through our central role on campus, we can continue to initiate and or support collaborative efforts to bring all the necessary groups and departments together to find solutions. These can be sponsored program offices, research offices, data management support, institutional repositories, departmental administrative support, and specifically grant administrative support, compliance and ethics, legal offices, especially copyright and IP experts, data security, provost level representatives and above, IT solutions, and many others. With the shared goal of making things easier for faculty and researchers, we will work together with campus partners to design and create tools and workflows that insert their compliance into the research processes. Through events such as this one and other marketing and outreach efforts, we can raise awareness about why and how to be compliant. And finally, we can continue to advocate for passing open access policies at institutions or in individual colleges that do not yet have one. With these mandates, there is an opportunity to expand the conversation to talk about open and public access beyond just that affected by the mandates. This then can help create campus-wide support systems that will include open access and public access as part of an institutional support system. Thanks.